if you were going to write a book for God uh, and you were going to put the last chapter in it, uh, what would be the subject of that chapter? I mean, if you had to do that, like what would, of all the topics you could cover, and God said, I want you to write this book for me, the Psalms, and the last chapter that you're going to write, i.e. chapter 145, the last Davidic Psalm, what, what would it be about? Uh, and so David has covered anything and everything, has he not, in, in this book? I mean, we have covered all kinds of topics. Uh, what he's going to do is he's going to circle back and, and talk about praise, the importance of praise. Uh, and he's going to dig into it by uh, constructing an acrostic. So an acrostic, in case you, ha- if you don't remember, well, you're in the military. You probably know what an acrostic is. Do you not? Who am I to say? Um, so an acrostic is uh, you're going to take uh, every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 letters, and you're going, to, you're going to come up with an idea for each letter that represents, that's one reason to praise God, right? So if you're doing it in English, A would be whatever, B, et cetera. So we've covered this before. Uh, I think I have a picture of, okay, so there, so there you go, all right? Ready? Okay. So if you start over here, because Hebrew you read from right to left uh, like, like that. Uh, so this would be the first letter, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion. So when, you, when you're looking at all these letters, he's, each verse starts with one of these alphabetic letters. You see it in Hebrew. You don't see it in English. This is why I present to you, you must begin to learn Hebrew now to prepare yourself for heaven later, Correct. The only problem here is be, this is a mame, uh, the M, and this is another way you write mame at the end of a word. It looks like that. So that's really the same letter. Uh, noon uh, is the N, and this is the way you write noon at the end of a word. And then samek is the next letter. Now, why am I talking about this? Because you're like, this is too early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, hey, trust me. That, that letter is missing. There's no N. So uh, David didn't know the alphabet? I mean, he's Jewish. I mean, how could he not know the alphabet? And so I was pondering that this week as I'm looking at the fact that he's got all the letters there. He missed one. You know, what is, I don't know what questions you're going to ask when you get to heaven. I've got to find David and go, hey, dude. Psalm 145, I had issues grammatically. The noon was missing. Uh, and, and why? Well, you know, if they leave things out, uh, when you leave things out in gram- grammar, it's called uh, el- ellipsis. Ellipsis. It means you did it on purpose. It means you left it out. It's like you're speaking in a way to emphasize things. So that's interesting because if you apply that grammatical principle to Psalm 145 and you look at verse 14 where the noon should be, the letter N, and it's not there, you read it. I'll give you permission. Just read it right now. Just in your mind. Just read it. No one's looking down. You haven't memorized? What's it say? The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. I would just submit to you, this has got nothing to do with my sermon. This is just grammatical stuff that interests me. So I got to talk about it. (coughs) Sorry. There's no noon on 14. Why? Because I think David, at the end of his book, wants he's talking about praise and he wants to highlight verse 14. So he leaves out the noon. So everybody reading is going, whoa, there's an issue. There's an issue. Why? He wants to showcase what God's like. What's he like? When you fall down, who's there? Did you hear me? When, when you fall down, because you're going to fall down, he's there to uphold you. He's there to help pick you up. Uh, when you are bowed down from the pressures of life, from medical issues, except this is a whole sermon in verse 14. When you got marital issues and dysfunction and things happening like that, um, he's there to help you, right? Right? Uh, Liz's uh, stepfather died last Sunday. Uh, had dementia, got home uh, from my uh, uh, Sunday night class on Revelation and got the news that he had passed away uh, in San Diego. Um, so I called the VA because I had arranged all his VA funding um, to assist him. So I called the VA, which is always difficult. You're going through the matrix of numbers and it's, it's unbelievable. You know what I'm talking about? Oh my gosh. I know more about the VA than I think soldiers do. And uh, so I call, I was dreading it. So I called the VA to turn off all of his benefits and, um, so, you know, it's a typical lady, you know, just going through the ropes. Uh, you know, and, I, and I just told her, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor, you know, and you know, it's been hard, you know, shepherding my father, stepfather-in-law, uh, you know, all these many miles away. But, you know, uh, God took him home and everything like that. She goes, you're a pastor? I go, yeah. Now, this is the VA, all right? She told me, she goes, uh, I, I have a problem with my husband. <laughs> I'm like, excuse me? She goes, yeah, uh, we're having... We've been married 24 years. We got some marital issues. Really? I go, well, 
this is a sovereign arrangement because God had me call you, because I hit quadrant four, sector four, because I'm the fiduciary, sector four, and they bumped me to sector three, which has never happened to me. So I'm, I'm talking sector three in the country, not sector four, it's like sin. And I said, it's, it's, it's by, not by accident that I got sector three today because God wanted me to talk to you about your husband. And so she said, well, would you pray for me? I said, all day long, all day long. Have you ever prayed for someone at the VA? I bet you have. God help them get their act together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this was not part of my sermon. I'm sorry, I'm deviating, but I submit that because verse 14 applied to that, that lady on the phone and her husband, Richard. Because she's like, you could pray for me right now on the phone. I'm like, why not? I said, you're helping me with my father-in-law's, stepfather's, you know, issue. And, and I'm going to help you with the spiritual things. I'm a brother in Christ. Let's pray. See, isn't that, isn't that praiseworthy? I mean, it is. Anyway, back to my sermon. Let's get on with it. Uh, so we've gone through the grammatical stuff. Now, we want to dive in. It's like, well, what's David getting at here? He, if you look at this passage, the 21 verses, which I did this week, uh, a hermeneutical question arises, which is simple. What are the reasons for praising God? Because that's what an acrostic is. Well, let me give you all the reasons for praising God from A to Z. And I've had you, by assignment-wise, pr present you know, your, yours to me. Like, if you had to go A to Z, these are the reasons why I praise God. You know, what would they be? I have a ton of these that you have mailed me uh, as we've done this. But we, we want to close out more reasons, because there's always more reasons for praising God. Now, we could look at a, a complex structure, uh, like a complex rhetorical structure to, to uh, number 145, or a simple one. Which one would you choose? <laughs> so, simple. So would I. Who wants to go into the uh, complex? We're going to look at the simple. So I would devise this passage into two quadrants. Number one, uh, so what are the reasons for praising God? Uh, answer one is, we praise God for his amazing, glorious kingdom. That's why we praise him. See, that's why we praise him. Because the earthly kingdoms have issues, do they not? The man of clay feet doing all kinds of things. It's like, you got to be kidding me. They're not ever going to be optimal. You can't, you can't vote in everything you want. It's great peace, utopia. It's not going to happen until Jesus appears. So in the meantime, we praise God for his glorious kingdom. So that is all we're going to talk about is just that one point in the first nine verses. Uh, let's answer it. This, there's an answer here. Uh, we praise him for his kingdom. It says in verse one, this is a psalm of praise. It, and it's of David. Now, it usually says it's a psalm of David. This is an unusual one. So David closes out his version of the Psalter and says, my last one, the last chapter that I'm gonna write, well, it, it's from me, but boy, this one's about praise. So you have to stop and ask yourself, do I really think about praise all that often? Because he did. Now, let's di dive into what he said about that. He says in, ver in the first verse, he says, I, as a Christian, will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. I will extol thee, O, o, o my God, you are the King. He's gonna focus on the, the kingdom of God because he's thinking about it. Yeah, and the more you mature in your faith, the more you will think about the kingdom of God because in the Lord's prayer, you're praying for the kingdom to come, correct? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then the next thing you pray is, Thy kingdom come. Because you look at the old world around you and you're like, this ain't working. Well, the king's gotta come. And so he, he's praying that God, I, I, I think about you a lot because you are my king and I will always praise your name. So eschatologically, eschaton meaning the end of all things. Uh, eschatology, the study of the end. We're studying uh, Revelation on Sunday night. We're in chapter 19. We're nearing the end. It's awesome. We're studying the second coming. Uh, we're not doing that tonight because it's gonna be snow and ice. Who would show up? Uh, and so we'll, we'll push that off to the next weekend. Uh, but we look eschatologically that God's kingdom is coming. Old and New Testaments both talk about his kingdom coming. Uh, however, long before God's kingdom actually comes, the messianic kingdom with Christ as the great Davidic king, God's on his throne. I mean, haven't you ever looked around, watched the news, read the news and thought, what is up with God? Is he on his throne? Answer to a Christian is, oh yeah, he's always on his throne. He never leaves it. He never looks the other way. He's never caught off guard. He never has an ha uh oh moment. Man, I should have been looking over there. No, he's, he's always on his throne. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 16, which the difference between kings and chronicles, just as a side point, chron uh, kings looks at the time of the kings from a political perspective. Chronicles looks at the period of the kings from a pastoral priestly perspective. So notice what it says in First Chronicles 16 verse 31 about God. It says, let the heavens be glad 
Let the earth rejoice. Let them say among the nation, what? Lord reigns. See, we tend to forget this as you get down in the, into the muck and the, and, the, and the mire and the sin of a given week. You tend to forget all that stuff. And the devil whispers in your ear, there's no hope, it's all over, etc." cetera. And, no, and, and what does God say? Uh, you gotta remember, I reign, I reign. Uh, Psalm 99, uh, verse one, we're going back a, a few months. Psalm 99, verse one says, the Lord reigns, present tense, past tense, future tense. I know it's grammar, I know it's early. That, oh, you recognize the verb, do you not? <laughs> the Lord reigns. See, it's present tense. It's, it's, it's ongoing. It's ongoing. Now, let the peoples tremble. Why? Because he's holy. We're going to respond to him one day, be responsible to him one day. He's enthroned above the cherubim. He's speaking about uh, his dwelling above the Ark of the Covenant, also referring to his throne. Ezekiel chapter 1, his throne is literally above the cherubim class of angels who serve underneath him. Uh, and they're like his bodyguard, as it were. Um, it says the Lord reigns. So his, earthly em, empires come and go. I mean, there's some, I went on the, I went on to the, uh, the CIA has a, like a website. And I went on their website today, like what countries are not around anymore? <laughs> it was amazing. The list of countries that aren't there anymore. Because earthly empires, they come and go, but no matter whether they're here, or they're almost out the door, or they're long gone, who's always on his throne? God He's always on his throne. And so he's the king of kings. And, and David says, uh, well, as I start this song of praise, I need to remember in my mind, as I look at my life as a politician and as a king and a general, that God is always on his throne. I mean, you could just stop right there. We could stop the sermon right there because that is enough, is it not? Because when you think about that, if God is on his throne, what does that mean? Well, you should have what? You should have hope, joy, peace, Anything else? Victory. I mean, you could just go on, right? I mean, you could just go on. But I got a sermon to preach. So, um, you with me? Yeah. So, how I want to move through this uh, is by uh, establish the fact that God's on his throne. But then as we think about his throne, we can, that's totally praiseworthy because he's the king. Uh, we want to look at questions and answer questions that are posed all throughout this text. So, we want to look at verse 2, which really tells me, how often should we praise him for his kingdom? I mean, when you think about the kingdom of God, how often should you praise him? Well, notice what he says in verse two. Every day I'll bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is, I can't even fathom it. He said it's unsearchable. He said, he's not saying that you need to quit your job and just sit in your little cubicle at the Pentagon, you know, four floors down or wherever you are with no windows. You know what I'm talking about? And your boss comes by and goes, what have you been doing? You haven't been moving. Your mouse isn't even moving. I am just praising God. That's what the pastor told me to do, right? If you're commuting, you're slugging, you know, whatever you're doing, you know, I know you're not supposed to talk in the car, right? Yeah, this is verboten, yeah. So it's supposed to be quiet, but it's like, if anybody wants to talk to you, you just tell them, hey, 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 I am praising God 24 seven. Is he telling you to just do it 24 seven and never stop? Is he telling you that? No, it's probably hyperbolic. And you, you use hyperbole, don't you? Where you overemphasize something, you know? To, to say the point, that's what he's probably doing. He's basically saying with hyperbole, just have a mindset of praise that you think about praise. Now, when you think about praise, he's gonna tell you here, I, I will bless thee and I'll praise thy name forever and ever. And then he's gonna throw in in verse three, why he does it. He, he says, I do this because God's great. God's unsearchable. See, Isaiah, when you go to Isaiah six, which is a tremendous passage, when Isaiah is transported into the throne room of God, and here's the angelic class, the seraphim class, constantly chant, chanting to God, Kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy is the Lord. He's here in this rhythmical holiness of God. He sees the holiness of God. Uh, he has all kinds of reasons why to praise God. He saw the throne. Daniel, same thing. Daniel chapter seven, verses nine to 10. Uh, he sees God on his throne prior to the judgment, the final judgment, and his throne is issuing forth fire because he's coming in judgment. And he's got many reasons to praise God because he realizes one day all earthly kingdoms will, be, kingdoms will be laid low and the king of kings will reign. He, I, I have reasons to praise God. But David says, I praise God because when I think about his greatness, man, it's off the grid. It's off the charts. It's unsearchable. Uh, Wayne Grudem, uh, in his uh, systematic theology titled uh, Bible Doctrine, Essential Teachings of the Christian Faith, says this about the unsearchable nature of God. And it's a paragraph. I don't usually read a lot, of, a lot of stuff like this, but it's just too good. So I gotta read it to you. 
He says, we can never fully understand God. Isn't that the truth? Uh, God is fi infinite and we are finite or limited. We can never fully understand God. He said, in this sense, God is said to be incomprehensible, where the term incomprehensible is used with an older sense of unable to be fully understood. This sense must be clearly distinguished from the more common meaning, quote, unable to be understood, unquote. He said, it's not true to say that God is unable to be understood, but it is true to say that he cannot be understood fully or exhaustively. He says, we will never be able to measure or fully know the understanding of God. It's far too great for us to, equal, uh, to, to understand him. He says, similarly, when thinking of God's knowledge of all of his ways, David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it, Psalm 139. He says that the doctor, this doctrine of God's incomprehensibility has, has much positive application for our own lives. It means that we will never be able to know too much about God, for we will never run out of things to learn about him. Uh, we will thus never tire in delighting in the discovery of more and more of his excellence and of the greatness of his works. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I've, I've been walking with God since 1967, and I am still enthralled at what I don't know about how great he is. And as the road narrows and you're like, man, how many more years do I have on the planet? I'm starting to think, man, I, I just gotta, I gotta get more into him to understand him more. Because pretty soon I'll, be, I'll stand before him and give account and what a glorious day, but I'll never totally understand him. I know a lot about him. I know that he gave us uh, communicable, communicable attributes in theology, that's what they call it. He communicated attributes to us that we understand because they're related to him, but we get them because we're humans. So we have things like spirituality, knowledge, wisdom, truth, goodness, love, holiness, justice, etc. We understand those things because he communicated that all to us, right? But then there's things about him that are called incommunicable attributes. He didn't give us. Those are the ones that we struggle to understand. Like what did he not give us? Well, uh, his total independence. Because according to Acts 17, 24 to 25, he doesn't re really need us or any part of the creation for him to function effectively, correct? He's perfect. Uh, he didn't share that independence with us. Uh, your high school students might feel it, but, but no, no, God is totally independent. He's unchangeable, Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. Uh, he's eternal, uh, Romans 1, 8. Uh, he, he has omnipresence, he has omniscience, etc. He didn't share those with us, right? Anybody here omniscient? Wouldn't it be awesome to be? Wouldn't it be awesome if you're omnipresent? You could be at home, watching the game, and at work. <laughs> you know? No, he didn't share those with us. And so the more you study God, it's like, I can understand the communicable attributes to a degree, but when I get into the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity, how God's person functions, the mysteries are there. The mysteries are there, so I have limitations. So he asked his question, how often should you praise God? Well, I should praise him constantly because of who that is. That's some kind of king. Number two, who should praise him? Verse four, one generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts, one glorious, uh, on the glorious splendor of thy majesty and on thy wonderful works. He says, I will meditate on those things. He says, a man shall speak of the power of thine awesome acts, and I will tell of thy greatness. I'll think about your greatness, and I'll talk about it. They shall eagerly utter the memory of thine abundant goodness, uh, and shall shout joy, joyfully of thy righteousness. He says, I, all throughout this passage, he talks about the wonderful works of God, his amazing works, his miraculous works that you either read about or experience. And he says, when you understand them, you talk about them. Notice he says, who should praise God? One generation, that's you. Should be telling the next generation, that's who? Kids. And, and if you're single, who are you talking to? Are hey, your friends' kids? <laughs> friends' kids, that's good. Yeah, your friends' kids, you're talking to family members, you're talking to friends. You know, so don't look at that and go, hey, I'm out. No, it's one generation should be telling the other about the great things that God has done in your life. Now stop and think about it. I had to think about this. When I think about the th off the chart things that God has done in my life, like what are they? I mean, when I saw him move in a way that I was like, that's totally him. What's, what is yours that you would think that the next generation 
needs to know. Because realize when that next generation, like my children, now my grandchildren, well, I know when they go off to college, I know what the college is going to try to do to them. Imagine when they try to pervert, twist their thinking away from God, that that child stands up at, and says at 20 years old, well, I know that's erroneous because I've heard the stories of the great things that God has done in my family. Let me share one with you. It's that kind of thing. Are you telling the generations to come the great things that, have got, that God has done? Uh, Joshua did this. I mean, after uh, God parted the, re the, re the Red Sea and then God then parted the Jordan River at flood tide, I mean, there's two million Jews waiting on the eastern shore by Shittim, uh, sitting there, you know, waiting to cross, but it's flood tide. And what did God do? You read Joshua? What did God do at flood tide? Part of, part of the river. I mean, it's one thing to part a, a lake. It's another thing to part a river at flood tide. That's what God did. He just, he, just, he just stopped the river upstream and everything flowed down to the Dead Sea. He dried up the, the, the mud immediately and all 2, 000, 2 million Jews walked to the other side. So then what'd they do? I mean, that would be something you'd want to tell others about, correct? I was there. I saw it. Right, Joshua chapter four. Notice what it says. Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. So they had to pick up how many stones? 12. You guys are great mathematicians. It's awesome. Uh, let this be a sign, a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, uh, hey, mom and dad, you know, what's that stack of stones? And what do those stones mean? You shall say to them, quote, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. And thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded. And they took up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, uh, just as the Lord spoke to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. How many stones? 12 stones. And we're not talking pebbles. And they carried them over to, uh, to them to the lodging place and they put them down there. I'm sure they stacked them there. So that any time an Israelite walked by that and, and the, the eight-year-old, the 10-year-old said, hey, what's up, with the, what's up with that symmetrical stack of 12 stones? They would say, well, you, let me tell you the story of what God did. You share one generation tells the other generation the greatness of God and what God has done. What would be the story that your children, your friends, your family need to know that you've seen the movement of God in your life? I'll share one with you. And I've probably shared this before. I, I, I can't remember if I have. So bear with me. When God does something, you gotta talk about it, right? You gotta talk about it more than one time. So excuse me if I said this before, but at this point in my life, I can't remember if I talked about it. <laughs> Years ago, I mean, Liz and I rented homes because we never had enough money to buy a home, especially in California. So we rented for like, I don't know, I don't even know, 12 years, something like that. We, we just could never afford a home in California. So my parents uh, came to us and said, we're gonna give you some inheritance money to buy a home. So they did, they gave us $9,000. Uh, that allowed us to buy a home and qualify for an FHA loan and buy our first home. So we, so we went shopping and one of my uh, elders on my elder board owned over 50 homes in California. So I asked him, very wise man, I said, what do we look for? He goes, you look for the, the house that needs a lot of work in a really nice neighborhood. And then you use all your skills to fix it. That's exactly what we did. So we bought our first home. It was a fixer upper and we fixed it. The only thing was when we totally fixed it, I'm talking poured a new 20 something, I mean a huge patio, redid the yard, redid the house. I mean, when it was all done with all my friends in the trades. Liz looked at me one night and she goes, on sitting on the patio, she goes, hey, we're totally done remodeling this house. We should probably sell. <laughs> like you're out of your mind. Well, anyway. So we did, we sold our home. <laughs> happy wife is a, happy life is in the Bible somewhere. So, so we sold our home that I had put tons of labor into remodeling the whole thing with my friends and uh, we sold it. And so that $9,000 became $127,000 profit. I'd say that was pretty good. Where'd that money come from? King of Kings said, Marty, I'm working in your life. I'm gonna give this to you. I'm gonna trust this to you. It's for later. And I'll explain later to you in just a minute. So, so, uh, so we sold that house and we wanted to move into, right next to us was a brand new uh, gated community. So we thought that'd be fun to live in a gated community. So we rented a house in a gated community, put the money in CDs when they actually used to pay money, remember? 
Uh, and we bought some CDs, staggered them, and then we went and, and rented a house in this gated community. You do not want a pastor in a gated community. Why? You want to see him. You're outside the gate. <laughs> uh, hey, I, I got an issue. I need to talk to you. Uh, please press 157. You know, I mean, well, it's not, it's not working. I mean, and so after uh, doing that for a year, we decided a pastor should not live in a gated community because no one can get to me. Bad idea. So after a year, we decided we we're going to put together a list of what we want to see in our dream home, what we wanted. So we came up with a list uh, of our dream home. And not, not that we're super materialistic, but, but God gave us this money. And like, if we had to buy a house, what we like. So we took that money and we went shopping a year later. Uh, and uh, we drove around where the church was, was a new area called the Spanos Development Center around the lake. And that's where Alex Spanos that owned the Chargers my, my best friend was his head bodyguard. So we went shopping out there in the Spano Center in January in the fog, depressing, driving around, looking for our house, found nothing, found nothing. Finally pulled into a cul-de-sac on our, on our way out and stopped kind of depressed. And at the head of the cul-de-sac was the house that was like, man, that, wow. And it wasn't for sale. So I stopped and I prayed, dear God, I, I don't ask you for material things, but you know, we need a house. And if I was to get a house, if it was that house like that, I'd be totally happy. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Drove out of the cul-de-sac, went home that night. One of our ladies, uh, Carol Meehan, had knee surgery. Uh, I called to see how she was doing. You still with me? Yeah. yeah. So I called Carol to see how she's doing, and a friend answered the phone. Her name's Ruth. Uh, Ruth uh, was wealthy, quite wealthy. A godly woman, avid gardener, worse than me. Uh, her husband had passed away years before I had done his funeral, and she was from uh, the South. So I called, and she answered. And I said, how's, how's Carol? She said, she's doing great. And, uh, and she said, what, you know, what are you and Liz been doing? I said, and she used to be a real estate agent. And I said, well, we've been out looking for a home. Oh, really? What kind of home are you looking for? Blah, blah, blah. And then she says this to me, why don't you come on to my house and check it out? That's what she told us. She goes, my husband's dead. And I don't need this big spread. And so why don't you just come in like at my house? And I, I said, Ruth, I, I don't think we could afford your house. And she said, no, come on over. She gave me the address. The next day, Liz and I went for a drive. It was that house. I still get chills thinking about it. It was that house. That house. We went inside, five bedrooms, wraparound white staircase, three-car garage, RV parking, and a yard to die for. I mean, it was, it, was like, it was like, oh, this is unbelievable. I've been blessed, but I can't afford it. <laughs> went out in the back patio, we're standing there, and Ruth's talking to us, phone rang. She went inside, and I looked at Liz, and I'm like, honey, you realize there's no way we can afford this house. She goes, yeah, I know, but it is really cool. So Ruth came outside, and she goes, well, what do you think? Well, what do I think? It, it, Ruth, I said, there's no way we can afford this. She goes, oh, yeah, I'll make you a deal. <laughs> <laughs> She said, my, my house has appreciate, appreciated 5% a month since I bought it, like, you know, five, six years ago. It's a brand new home. And she said, I will sell it to you for no appreciated value, and I'll be the real estate agent. We bought that house. Now, what we didn't know is the seven years we owned that house, that was not our dream home forever because God had a plan for me to move here. And God, the King of Kings, knew that Liz and I couldn't afford to move here <laughs> if we didn't own that house. You follow me? That's the only way I could come. Otherwise, I'd be living in a tent somewhere. Because we, what could be more expensive than California? Burke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't God funny? Aren't, aren't his ways unsearchable? I mean, I was so excited about that whole thing because we bought that house. It was amazing. Positioned us to buy it, our home here, et cetera. I went to a pastor's conference in Phoenix uh, not long thereafter, and I was sitting there with a bunch of my pastoral friends at a, at a break, and I was telling them, I got to share with you what God did. But I pulled into the cul de sac and I prayed. I mean, it was the house. They were like, awesome, man. Well, there's a guy sitting in front of me. I don't even know him. He's sitting there with his pastoral buddies. Uh, and uh, he's listening. I don't know he's listening to me. And so and when I'm done talking, he turns around, and he goes, man, I am sorry for listening to you, but I am blessed. <laughs> he said, my wife and I are looking for a house and we're having a hard time. This is amazing. 
I go, I say, I'm not telling you the story to tell you this is exactly what's going to happen for you, but that's God. See, give him praise. See, this is the stuff you tell your daughter, your son, your grandchildren. Hey, I remember back in 2003, see, when God did something miraculous, as the king of kings, he moved in real estate to position us to go pastor a church over here to make it possible. That's God. That's God. You telling your stories to your children, friends, what, here's your assignment for the day, what would be the story? Next, why should you praise the Lord uh, of the kingdom? Uh, we'll close with this. It says in verse eight, the Lord is what? Gracious and merciful. He's also, boy, aren't you glad? He's slow to anger and he's great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all in his mercies. He's, his mercies, they're over all of his works. This is amazing. So in the Hebrew text, gracious and merciful appear first in the text. They're not verbs. So that means they're totally emphatic. And see the word is there, the copula, the verb? It's not in the Hebrew text either. He left it out. In fact, when you look at slow to anger and great and, and loving kindness, there's no verb there either. And those words slow to anger and loving kindness also appear first in the clause. What's that mean? They're emphatic. So David, David leaves the verbs out. Imagine talking with no verbs. Very staccato. Why is he doing that? To emphasize who God is. Who is God? Why would you want to praise him? Because he's gracious and he's, he's merciful. Adam and Eve sinned willfully in the garden. What did God do? Showed grace and mercy to sinners. Uh, Cain murdered his brother Abel. What did God do? He was, well, he showed grace and mercy to Cain. Uh, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. And what did God do? He showed grace and mercy to the other brothers. Uh, when Israel constantly re rebelled against God during the period of the judges, I mean, like from 1390 BC to 1051 BC, uh, God was merciful. Why? Well, he sent them in those seven cycles of sin, deliverers. Like Othniel, Ehud, Shagmar, Deborah, Samson. He could have said, seven cycles of sin, I'm done with you. Ah, no. See, God is gracious and merciful. Uh, that's why you should praise him. When you look at your life, he is absolutely merciful. Peter denied Christ how many times? Three, three times. When Jesus comes and meets Peter post-resurrection, he tells Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? He uses three different Greek words to explain, I mean, do you love me like a friend? You know, do you? He uses all the Greek words. And then he asks him, do you love me like agape love me? Peter's like, Lord, you know I love you. And then he tells him what? Go feed my sheep. I forgive you. Feed my sheep. This is grace and mercy. Hasn't he showed this to you? Instead of focusing on all your problems, focus on, man, God's been gracious and merciful to me. I need to praise him for that. And he's also slow to anger because if he wasn't, we wouldn't be here, <laughs> right? He's slow to anger. I mean, from 722 BC, uh, after the nation uh, uh, of Israel, the 10, 10 tribes fell, uh, until 586, uh, God was merciful. He was merciful when the kingdom split in two in 930 BC. He was merciful to the, merciful to the Northern Empire. So from 930 BC to 722 BC, for 208 years, God spoke through the prophets to Northern Israel and told them, repent, or I will judge you. I had a college student ask me this week, why is the God of the Old Testament angry and wrathful and the God of the New Testament is full of peace and grace? Whoa, 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 whoa. You do not understand the God of the Old Testament. For 208 years, he was, he was full of grace and mercy, but he said wrath was coming. Same thing with Israel. He gave uh, Judah 136 years to repent or they'd be facing captivity. They didn't, so he had to judge them. God's full of grace, mercy. Aren't you glad he's slow to anger? Verse nine said he's good to all. His mercies, well, they're over all of his works. See, if you look at our politicians, they are favoritistic. They are all about favoritism. That is not God, aren't you glad? See, if God showed favoritism, he would look down and go, hmm, blue states, red states, hmm. What would you think he'd do? Well, it depends on what your political stance is. <laughs> well, if I was God, I'd take out all the red states. Uh, if it was God, I'd take out all the blue states. See, see, they're totally favoritistic. No, David says, when I look at God, I cannot believe that he, he looks at all people, godly people and ungodly people, and he is good to all. Aren't you glad that he is? See, 
Because if we were the king, we were God, we would look at, oh, North Korea, I'm taking them out tomorrow morning. Oh, the Chinese, they're causing all kinds of problems. I'm, uh uh-uh. On that whole Russian problem, you know, on the border over there, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to take it. One angel is going to pass through the camp and wipe out the whole army. I mean, we'd be thinking like that. God looks down and goes, no, I I don't want anybody to slip into eternity without knowing me. I'm going to be gracious to them. I'm going to show grace to all of them. Aren't you glad that he does? Peter looks at that and says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise about has some count slowness, but he's patient toward you, not wishing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. See, the electricity works at your house. You, you, you get food, you know, you get snow. <laughs> you get all these things because God looks down at you and says, well, I know you don't know me and I know you, you've been walking against me. I still love you anyway. I died for you. What are you waiting for in coming to me in faith? He's, he's, not, he's, he, he's waiting for you. And then if you do know him, uh, you should be praising him for his kingdom because his kingdom is full of grace, mercy, and we as Christians focus on that. So I have an assignment for you. You ready? God, today I will praise your kingdom because of X. Start filling in the blank. I did. God, I will praise your kingdom because of this and begin to list them. And the second assignment is, I already gave it to you. What do you need to tell those people around you that God has done that's miraculous? So he gets the praise and, they, and, and he gets the glory and people get encouraged. What is that story? Tell it, because that's what a mature Christian's all about. Let's pray. God, thank you for how great you are, how you work in our lives in ways that are jaw dropping. You take us through desert periods And then you pour water all over the parched ground and we can see it's from your good hand. Thank you for who you are, your great character. Bless us this day because we've come out in the cold to put you first and we praise your great and mighty name. Bless our nation, bless our leaders and may we be a people uh, as a church and as a nation that turns to you first above all things. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.